Hello, California Democrats, and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. In recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month, I've been talking a lot lately about uh, one of my heroes, Willie Velasquez. Willie Velasquez, a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, dedicated his life to improving the freedom to vote in Latino communities. His motto was, su voto es su voz, your vote is your voice. In 1974, Willie founded the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project, and in just 10 years, the number of Latinos registered to vote nearly doubled because of Willie's work and the work of other activists. And by the way, in the same 10 years, the number of Latinos in elected office nearly doubled as well. That's the power of the freedom to vote. It gives every American a voice in our democracy and moves us towards a more inclusive democracy. But recently, the fundamental right to vote has come under attack across the country as Republican state legislatures try to take us backwards and block voters from accessing the ballot box. It's no surprise that their claims of widespread voter fraud are often targeted at communities of color. But in the face of this opposition, we have a responsibility to fight back. That's why I'm honored to be leading the fight to pass the Freedom to Vote Act, which would make it easier for all eligible citizens to register to vote and to cast their ballot. Its policies are based on the tried and true reforms that we've seen work in states across the country, including right here in California. That's why today's conversation is so important. California Democrats have already paved the way for the implementation of smart, effective voting rights policies here at home. And now we have the opportunity to encourage the rest of the country to follow our lead. Here in California, we implemented automatic voter registration when I was Secretary of State, and it had a huge impact on Latino voters. Voter registration grew by a higher proportion in Latino communities than in other places, specifically in Latino areas, registration rates increased by 16% on average compared to 11% elsewhere. And now the Freedom to Vote Act would require every state to have automatic voter registration. Just think about what that could mean for Latinos across the country and their ability to participate in our democracy. So uh, in honor of Willie Velasquez, let's dedicate this Hispanic Heritage Month to spreading the right to vote. Because it is, he always said, su voto es su voz. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Senator Padilla. Uh, muy buenas tardes, good evening. Uh, my name is David Campos, and I am honored to stand before you as the second vice chair of the California Democratic Party. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es David Campos, y tengo el honor de presentarme a ustedes. Uh, como el vicepresidente del Partido Demócrata. I'd like to begin uh, the program uh, by thanking the amazing staff of the California Democratic Party uh, who have worked to make this possible, uh, this event possible. Uh, India Thomas, Moises Garcia, Vincent Jones, and of course, we're very proud of our executive director, Yvette Martinez. And as we celebrate this evening, Latino, Hispanic, Heritage Month, I think it's really important to underscore the fact that we have a Latina serving in the very important role of executive director of the California Democratic Party. Uh, I'm also proud that this event uh, provides for Spanish translation uh, so that those who are monolingual speakers can participate in this celebration. You're going to hear tonight for some incredible individuals, uh, of course, beginning with my dear friend who heads the Democratic Party in Orange County, Ada Briseño, who is a Jane of so many trades and does so much for the party and the community. And you're gonna hear from some incredible people uh, like Roberto Gomez, uh, President David Huerta of SEIU USWW, uh, of course, uh, the head of the Chicano Latino Caucus, Carlos Octala, and what you see is Latinos and Latinas leading throughout this Democratic Party in different parts of the state. And we're very proud of that. But I want to underscore tonight uh, something that I think we need to acknowledge. 
that we wanna thank the Latino community in the state of California that came out and voted uh, to keep Gavin Newsom in office by coming out and voting against this recall. We wanna thank you Latino voters for doing that. And I wanna acknowledge that this is a community that came out to vote even though they've had challenges in the last few years with this pandemic. This pandemic has disproportionately impacted Latinos and Latinas. And we as a democratic party have an obligation to make sure that their issues, their needs are addressed. And this takes me to my last point. And this is an ask of every one of you that is participating tonight. We need to make sure that we continue to reach out to the Latino community in California, and that requires resources. For us to be able to mount the, the kind of uh, on the ground campaign, the kind of advertising that, that speaks to monolingual voters, we need resources. So I am also asking you to make sure that you contribute to the party tonight so that we have the resources to communicate with this very important community. Estoy muy orgulloso de ser Latino y demócrata. I'm very proud to be a Latino and to be a Democrat. And I want to thank again the important, the very important contributions that we as Latinos are making to the Democratic Party, to the state of California, and to the entire country. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Greetings, everybody. My name is Sonia Diaz, and I'm excited to be here to share some data with you all from my organization, the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Um, we were able to do some rapid response analysis on election night to identify the might of Latino voters throughout the state. And the outcomes were seen that night, given how early it was called, but in the week that has followed, it's been clear that where other Californians voted differently, Latinos uniformly supported the Democratic Party and they swayed outcomes. I'm gonna go through a very quick slide I, deck. I have 10 minutes with you all. I'm gonna get through um, four regions and obviously this is available for you. And we're still waiting on data from some of the counties to get precinct level data to ascertain how Latinos voted there. But this really shows you the huge growth of the electorate, the trends of the electorate in terms of when they cast a ballot, and then ultimately their vote choice. Um, some of the methods here, you can look at this, but I'll give you the layman's kind of description, which is that back in 2018, my colleague, Dr. Matt Barreto and myself started doing this analysis of Latino voters and later Asian American voters. We look at precinct levels and we look at Latino registered voters. So this is not about eligible voters. This is not about likely voters, it's registered voters. And we're able to really show um, the ways in which these folks cast their ballot and how it sways outcomes. So the counties that are included in this analysis um, are really important. And I know that we've been able to get into the news and breakthrough in terms of national media, whether it was the New York Times Washington Post or even The Guardian. And some of the reasons for that, I think, are pointing out Orange County, Madera, and Merced County. And so what you're looking at is a table. And the table includes three columns um, that are important for you. Latino voters, the percent of them who voted no on the recall, and then non-Latino voters, who in most of these jurisdictions um, are white voters. And then the last column is, what was the outcome of recall in that particular county? So if I could just point your attention to a place like Orange County, where 81% of Latino voters voted no to recall compared to 40% of non-Latino voters, ultimately there was only a 1.7 percentage point um, win for the no on recall in that county. So you see the role of Latino voters there. Another place I want to show you that I think is really important is Merced County in the Central Valley. Here, 76% of Latino voters voted no on the recall, compared with only 15% of non-Latino voters. Ultimately, because of the growth of the Latino electorate in that jurisdiction, and then their vote choice, their preference for voting against the recall, again, very slim outcome. 52.1% of that county voted yes. It would have been a lot higher 
if Latinos didn't turn out. Um, last one that I think is important here is Contra Costa. And this is important because this was the highest uh, share of no that we saw to date in our findings, 93% of Latino voters voted no compared to 70%. So even in a county that is in the Bay Area, you still see Latino voters are markedly different than non-Latino voters. And then obviously there the share was 71.5%, which was no on recall. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for all of you to understand is that Latino voters essentially voted, um, I'm sorry here, um, they vote closer to election day. So this is partially that they're late deciders, but also some of the things that Senator Padilla was mentioning, which is the way that we have franchise expanding mechanisms, but that they are not fully communicated to low propensity voters or newly eligible voters. So we think about Asian Americans and Latinos in this context. What you see here is, is that as the days towards election day on September 14th run near, you see more and more Latinos cast a ballot. Now, Latino votes doubled once in-person voting opened. And so the single biggest day of when Latino voters in California cast a ballot was on election day. This is really important for GOTV. It means that GOTV is necessary. You need to invest in it. And it's important to get those door knocks because these are voters that will show up in person. Now, Southern California, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I know we have just such an amazing conversation. Um, Los Angeles, 83% of Latinos voted against the recall here. This is huge. Um, as you see on the bottom of the graph, 75%, you know, and what you're seeing is a blue line. So as a precinct in this county becomes more and more Latino, there's a higher share of them against the recall. And this is compared to the countywide average, which was only 70.7% of Angelinos who voted no. So Latinos were above the county average. I talked about Orange County. Um, this is important because unlike LA County, what you're seeing is literally an X. As the precincts, as the precincts get more and more Latino, they have more Latino registered voters. They're more against the recall. As precincts have less Latinos and are non-Latino, they are pro the recall. So you see that it's particularly an inverse. San Diego, also very similar um, and different, kind of thinking about them in the context of being in the middle between LA County and Orange County. Orange County, of course, having very important toss-up seats in the 22 midterms here in San Diego. We've seen um, changes in terms of the mayor and the County Board of Supervisors. Look at why that is happening. Look at how much Latinos understand and are accepting a progressive agenda. So 80% of Latinos here voted against the recall. Um, compared to only 20% for those precincts that were non-Latino. Ventura, 82%, and then I'm gonna move us to the Central Valley. Um, so we're still waiting for Fresno and Tulare and others. They haven't reported their data, but here's Madeira. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. I, I frequent Fireball, one of my closest friends from law school lives there. 80% of Latinos voted against recall. This, um, similar to Orange County, is a big X. You just see a huge, stark contrast. So only 30% of non-Latino voters in Madera County voted no on recall, but 80% of Latinos were voting against the recall. And so ultimately Madera was 61% in favor of recalling Governor Gavin Newsom. But imagine if Latino voters didn't cast a ballot, what that would look like. It would not be a 10.1% margin. Merced, this is huge because this literally is an inverse. So for all the Latinos who voted against the recall, the same amount of non-Latinos voted for the recall. And so in this way, Latino ballots are essentially neutralizing those of non-Latinos because they have such a high share and affinity for this progressive agenda. Bay Area, um, Alameda County, 76% of Latinos. Um, obviously this is you know, a more progressive Dem leaning county, but still very important. Contra Costa, I mentioned that earlier. San Francisco, um, where Vice Chair Campos is from, 88% of Latinos voted against the recall here. Um, this even was higher than the overall for the county city of San Francisco, which was 86%. So even in San Francisco, Latino voters um, by and large rejected the recall. San Mateo, 87% compared to 78% of all county voters who voted no. 
Um, and then obviously compared to 74% of non-Latinos. So Latinos again are casting ballots at higher rates. They're choosing no than non-Latinos. And so what this means is that if you invest in a Latino voter in California to turn out, you pretty much have um, a three to one chance that they're gonna vote for you if you are articulating an agenda that matters to them. That's very distinct than non-Latino voters, particularly white voters. Here in Santa Clara, 78% of Latinos voted against the recall. Again, this was higher than the countywide average of 73%. So Latinos are really clarifying their acumen for an investment and a campaign mobilization effort that clearly demarcates what's at stake. Sacramento, three out of four Latinos voted against the recall here. You're also seeing where um, there are some huge shifts between Latinos and non-Latinos. So again, this matters obviously for statewide. It also matters for local and municipal elections here if you get those Latinos to turn out. Sonoma, 85% of Latinos. I mean, you're thinking about wine country. You're thinking about an emerging and growing electorate that has dealt with the devastation of COVID and fires. And still they're um, voting against the recall at higher rates than countywide average. And I'm closing right now with a little bit, um, an end slide, really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to be here with you all and happy to be on a discussion later. And all of this is available on Twitter at UCLA Latino and on our website, latino.ucla.edu. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Sonia, so much uh, for that wonderful presentation. I can't wait to ask you questions and hear from you. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Ada Briseño. I'm a Democratic National Committee member, chairwoman of the Democratic Party in Orange County, and co-president of Unite Here Local 11. As an immigrant, as a former hotel worker, as an organizer in labor for the last 30 years, I've worked to make sure that we expand the electorate by including Latino voters. This event is really near and dear to my heart. And I'm very thankful to the California Democratic Party for co-hosting this uh, beautiful event. And I'm grateful to Unite here and SEIU for being co-sponsors. Every day, it's my goal and the goal of many to figure out how to make the connection, the political connection to our Latino population. The folks in the industry that I represent, hotel and food service folks, are often too entrenched in making sure that they can provide for their families. Therefore, unions like SEIU and Unite Here, we're trying to do our best to make sure that we teach our members that every single road leads to politics, that voting means having a voice, that voting means making a fair living, having a roof over your head and breathing clean air. This is why both Unite Here and SEIU knock on doors for pro-union candidates. We donate our hard-earned dollars from our members so we can be successful, and most importantly, so we can have a seat at the table so our issues are heard. So tonight, our goal is to build more leaders in this work. So I want to enlist you, every single person on this call, to be a leader in this work the California Democratic Party, the uh, Chicano Latino Caucus, and every single county central committee, every single local Democratic club, all of us, we should have the same mission to build the Latino vote. We must ensure that Latinos keep feeling connected to our party on and off election time. We've got to teach Latinos how to be lifetime voters and vote in every single election. We've got to ensure that our elected officials are voting on the issues that are important to Latinos. And we've got to keep Latinos updated on the work when it happens. So folks, this isn't anybody else's job. This is our job. Con so we've got to connect with like-minded Latino leaders in your part of the state and start organizing one person, one relationship at a time. We've got to do this work across our state to increase our capacity. We must organize our communities to change the hearts and minds of voters. So I wanna ask you for a favor. I'd like you to use the chat to make a comment. Share in the chat where you live and what you're doing in your community. Let's learn from the work that we're collectively doing around uh, the state so we can replicate it in our counties. 
So tonight we look forward to hearing from leaders across California. I'll introduce each person and ask them a question before we go into a group discussion. And afterwards, you're here for more leaders within our state party. Thank you for your participation in your, this crucial discussion. I'd like to say it in Spanish now. Mi nombre es Ada Briseño. Soy miembro del Comité Nacional Demócrata, presidenta del Partido Demócrata del Condado de Orange y copresidenta de Unite Here Local 11. Como inmigrante y ex trabajadora de hotel y como organizadora laboral en mi sindicato por más de 30 años, he trabajado para crecer los votantes al incluir a los latinos. Um, este evento es muy importante y estoy muy agradecida con el Partido Demócrata de California por ser anfitrión de esta celebración de la herencia latina. Agradezco a Unite Here y a SEIU por su participación también. Y todos los días sabemos que tenemos un objetivo y es descubrir cómo hacer esa conexión con nuestra población latina. Las personas en la industria que yo represento de los hoteles y servicios de comida están muy preocupados para asegurar de que puedan mantener a sus familias. Y por lo tanto, tenemos un enfoque tanto Unite Here como el local, uh, uh, como SEIU, para que todos ten, uh, organicemos para asegurarnos que le debemos enseñar a nuestros miembros que todo lo importante conduce a la política. Sabemos que el voto tiene uh, una significancia enorme y que tenemos que, y significa cómo, cómo uh, lograr sueldos justos, tener un techo para nuestras familias y respirar el aire puro. Por lo tanto, uh, SEIU Unite Here tocan puertas para candidatos demócratas que trabajan con nuestros sindicatos. Donamos el dinero de nuestros miembros para que tengamos uh, un asiento en la mesa y poder sentarnos y discutir nuestros problemas y lograr soluciones. Esta noche nuestro objetivo es incluir a más líderes en este trabajo. Quiero reclutarlos a todos ustedes, a todas las personas en esta llamada, para que sean líder en este esfuerzo. El Partido Demócrata de California, el caucus latino, uh, chicano y cada comité central de los condados a través de California, cada club demócrata local, Todos nosotros tenemos una misma misión y, le, y tenemos que levantar el voto latino. Debemos asegurarnos que los votantes latinos sigan sintiéndose conectados, no solamente durante el tiempo de elección, sino que todo el tiempo. Debemos enseñar a los latinos cómo uh, voten en cada elección, no solamente una o dos, sino que cada elección es crucial. Y tenemos que asegurarnos que que nuestros electos voten con las cosas que son importantes para nosotros como latinos. Y tenemos que actualizar a los, a, a los votantes el trabajo que se está logrando. Compañeros, este no es trabajo de otra persona. Este es nuestra labor, conectarnos con otros líderes en nuestras áreas que comparten las mismas ideas y, es, y, y comenzar a organizar. Porque sabemos que organizando una persona y una relación a la vez es lo que crece la organización. Debemos hacer ese trabajo uh, en nuestro estado para aumentar nuestra capacidad y organizarnos en la comunidad para cambiar los corazones y la mente de los votantes. Así es que les pido un favor que usemos el chat para hacer un compromiso. Compartan por favor dónde viven y las técnicas que están utilizando para que así aprendamos y lo apliquemos nosotros en nuestro condado. Esta noche uh, yo espero escuchar a los líderes de California uh, presentar a cada persona, voy a hacerlo yo ahorita, para tener una discusión en grupo. Así es que muchas gracias por su participación eh, en, este, uh, en este Zoom tan crucial para nosotros. Y ahora me gustaría uh, traer otra vez a Sonia uh, Díaz. Sonia, I just want to take a moment to uh, introduce you. Uh, you're the founding executive director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. It's a comprehensive think tank that addresses most critical domestic policy challenges facing our communities of color. 
uh, in the in the states, uh, but also locally here. So we're very proud to have you here. I have been looking at the chat while you were talking, and I I, I would say that we hit a home run in understanding what's happened. Uh, in our diverse communities, but really thank you for highlighting the issues. And I have one question for you, in addition to thanking you for your presentation. And that is, you know, we saw, uh, and I'll try to combine a couple of questions at the same time, how about that? So we saw, and you told us the importance of, of, of election day, and we saw people, we saw Latinos go uh, and vote on election day. Why does that happen? And most importantly, right? Because we now have our ballots in our homes before election day, should we extend election day and get our vote out uh, you know, for a longer period of time? Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. So some of the things that are important is, is that the 2020 presidential election basically put how people typically vote on its face. Um, we were dealing with a global pandemic we also learned from one party in particular that the United States Postal Service was the boogeyman. And so more mature, older voters who uh, trends white and affluent typically took advantage of early vote and mail-in voting. They now go to the polls election day because of this um, incongruent and ultimately um, unfounded claim that there's voter fraud. Now, when we think about diverse voters, I think what's really important is that there's two ways to understand this. One. There's late investment. Um, these voters are not top of mind, particularly low propensity voters who are not in the universe of 50 plus one. And so what that means is that they're not getting mobilized and they're not being reached and door knocked and called um, in ways that are gonna be persuasive to them. Now, the second thing, and I think this is important, research from UCLA found that between 2002 and 2022, so we forecasted this, the increase of Latinos share of registered voters in the state of California has increased over 120%. For Asian Americans, 100%. And so you're looking at a recall that is a special election off cycle in September with two questions. There's a need for voter education, and that's the other part of how you really get these people to practice um, voting that is comfortable for them. And ultimately, we still have a lot of work to do, but Latinos showed up. That's wonderful, Sonia. Well, um, we will have further questions for you, but please stay tuned because we have fantastic um, uh, uh, other speakers who you'll get to meet. Um, so I'm now thrilled to introduce my friend, uh, Santana Mayor uh, Vincent Sarmiento. Uh, the city of Santana in Orange County has 87% Latinos, and it's one of the highest concentrations in the United States. And so Mayor Sarmiento has been serving uh, for a long period of time. In fact, um, in, in, in 2007, he was elected to city council, but in 2020, um, he was the correct person to lead us through this difficult time in this pandemic, especially in such an overwhelming uh, Latino community. And so I'm very proud to have him here. I'm proud to call him my friend, Mayor Sarmiento. Hola, gracias, Ada, y buenas tardes a todos. Um, me da mucho gusto de estar aquí con todos mis uh, uh, demócratas y, y el uh, Chicano Latino Caucus. And let me just say, you know, without SEIU and without United Here Local 11, I wouldn't be here as mayor. So it's a, it's a thrill and honor to be here with you. And as Ada was saying, um, look, I'm, I'm an immigrant myself. I, uh, my family arrived from La Paz, Bolivia. So a little trivia, I'm the first and only uh, Bolivian American uh, mayor in the entire country uh, that uh, represents a city of our size. But uh, really the story here in Orange County is you know, it's evolved so much from the time that we arrived in 1965. So we have to remember, this is where Reagan announced his presidency here in Fountain Valley in Orange County. This is where Nixon was born. This is where a guy went, where B1 Bob Bornan uh, represented us in, in the congressional district that represented Santana. We are now uh, a much, much different county. And that's thanks to people like Ada, thanks to, you know, efforts like uh, Unite Here and, uh, and SEIU and others and, and the party, right? I mean, just doing a lot of very hard work. And what inspires me the most is that I see in my city, a city of, you know, 77% Latinos, over 50% of them are foreign born. So we know their recent arrival 
uh, uh, immigrants, and many of them undocumented. But when they voted and when they helped others vote and, and spread the word, they wanted some change. And now they're seeing some very progressive public policy come out of Santana. And to be a Democrat in Orange County is very different than being a Democrat in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, I've lived there, went to school there and lived in L.A. as well. Here in Orange County, we're surrounded by some of the more reactionary Republicans, those that were funding uh, the recall effort, those that are most blatantly opposed to you know, vaccines and masks and just hostility. But look, I am just proud to stand with my fellow Democrats, especially the Chicano Latino Caucus. And I got to tell you, I was one of the first Chicano Latino fellows in the in when uh, so I got to thank you all for, for inspiring me and getting me started. But I'm just very happy that uh, we are demonstrating and not only that, you know, our, our, our successes, but those who supported us and are voting, they're starting to realize that they can win once they participate. They can change things in their lives and in their environment because to suffer loss after loss after loss, that is difficult to deal with. But once people start realizing I can change my community, I can change things that I know are important. Look, it just inspires people for the next uh, for the next election cycle. And we have people that are much more committed. So gracias a todos ustedes. I can't thank you all enough. Thank you, Mayor Sarmiento, and stay tuned for, for other um, questions here. Uh, so our next panelist, uh, I am delighted and honored to introduce uh, Angelica Salas. Angelica is an immigrant from Durango, Mexico, and Angelica joined Chirla uh, back in 1995 and became Chirla's executive director in 1999. In her role, she's transformed Chirla into a massive uh, membership immigrant led organization that empowers immigrants and their families to win local state and national policies and advance their human and civil and labor rights so i'm so delighted to have her on and angelica tenemos una pregunta para ti y la pregunta es um, how do we how do democratic uh, campaigns win over latino voters Bueno, um, lo voy a decir primero en español. Um, el Partido Demócrata tiene que entender que nuestra comunidad um, vive en español y en inglés. Y también que nuestra comunidad eh, tiene bastante conocimiento político y, y se, te, se le tiene que respe respetar ese conocimiento político. So, um, how uh, does our, the Democratic Party of California make inroads, more inroads with the Latino uh, community? Number one, that we, we, people need to understand we live in English and in Spanish, right? Um, that we, that it is important to outreach to us in the, in the different languages that we speak, but also that there is a recognition of the sophistication of our community in terms of politics. And that um, the messages that come to us are really about the issues that matter in, in our lives. Um, and that we understand that when we talk about California, we're talking about the Latino community and the immigrant community. So I'll give you a couple of, of statistics. 40% of the population of California is, is Latino or, or, or Latinx. 30% um, of the population of California is immigrant. And close to 50% of the children who every day are turning 18 are the children of immigrants. So when we're talking about the issues, um, this is what's gonna motivate our community. And, and so I think it's important to talk about the issues that matter um, to the Latino household. Y, y la otra cosa que es tan importante que, que se entienda por parte del Partido Demócrata es de que nuestra comunidad es bien numerosa. 40% de los californianos son latinos, 30% de los um, de los californianos son inmigrantes y casi la mitad de los niños son los hijos de inmigrantes. Entonces tenemos que entender que cuando estamos haciendo alcance a los votantes, a los votantes californianos, es, tenemos que tener una estrategia que va a la población y también um, que hablar sobre los temas que le importan a nuestra comunidad, que son temas verdad sobre um, sobre su, su bienestar. Y, y por ejemplo, obviamente, si vas a hablar uh, con la comunidad latina inmigrante, pues entonces tienes que hablar de una manera pro inmigrante. And lastly, if you're going to be talking to a community that is Latino, Latinx, and immigrant, you have to also speak from a pro-immigrant voice because it's going to matter to them. And that immigrants vote. 
There's 5 million immigrants who are voting in California. Cinco millones de inmigrantes son nuevos ciudadanos en California y se les tiene que hacer un alcance. Angélica, somos muchos y seremos más, right? Definitivamente. So, uh, David Campos said in a little, a little bit ago that we have some fantastic, extraordinary leaders, uh, Latino leaders in California. And I can't, uh, I, I couldn't agree with him more. And I'm going to now uh, have the pleasure of introducing my brother uh, in labor, David Huerta. He's the president of SEIU United Service Worker, uh, Workers West. Uh, a labor union that represents over 40,000 janitors, security officers, airport workers, and other property services across California. As a labor leader, his priorities are to improve the lives of working families throughout California and be an advocate for, the Cal uh, for California's immigrant population. And David is proud to carry on the Justice for Janitors movement into the 21st century. I'm so excited to see and hear you, David. Um, I have a question for you, and that is, uh, our immigrants are essential workers and they risk their lives um, and their families during this pandemic. And what concrete steps do you think our elected leaders have to take to ensure that immigrant essential workers are fully recognized for their courage and contributions to, to our country? Great, thank you, Ella. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but we've got to pin you. Give us a minute to pin you. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, we're, you're good. Are we good? There's okay, a, great. A, sorry about that. No issues, so just go ahead. There we speak. go. There we go. Okay, good. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit. Uh, so yeah, no, I, that's a great question. You know, I think, look, as essential work, Latinos, one, during this pandemic, made up the large majority of essential workers throughout the country. You know, they were doing the jobs in hospitals. They were doing the jobs in, 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 in uh, procuring and ensuring that businesses stayed open, um, doing all the jobs, deliveries, everything that is necessary in order to be able to be able to move things forward. And we have to recognize, and one thing that I, that I think is really important, and you and I share this, um, is that we really have to meet workers at where they're at. We really have to really address the issues of workers in, in general, but especially in this moment of COVID-19, we have to address them as who they are, and that is essential workers, right? And as essential workers, we need to make sure that we don't only advocate for them in their in in the sense of the protections they need and ensuring that they are that they are um, that they are going to be well represented uh, through this crisis, but to ensure that also we advocate advocate for them as much as we can in the sense of making sure that their conditions and the working conditions for working people in general, and especially for Latinos and immigrants, we continue to elevate that. Uh, we just got off a very successful campaign with Justice for Janitors. Um, we, got, we were able to get a pe defined benefit, benefit plan for over 20, 15,000 workers up and down the state, get them significant wage increases, um, because we really drove this question about being essential being an immigrant in this country, the contributions they're making, and how do we continue to drive that, um, not only in creating power as a union, but also creating power politically and connecting those two pieces. And so when we were able to win this contract most recently, we immediately pivoted from not only winning a contract, but demanding as essential workers that we demand a roadmap to citizenship. Um, and I think we have to continue to make those connections um, continue to drive those connections and really meet working people where they're at. And that's going to be the future of labor. That's going to be the future of the party. The party has to be able to meet workers where they're at, especially in this moment in time as essential workers and drive um, the, the needs of working people and most importantly, the needs of immigrant workers um, because they suffer. They suffered a, a tremendous amount of suffering um, those essential workers, they saw disproportionate um, numbers impacted by the COVID-19, and it was unions such as Local 11, HERE, who suffered huge losses as a result of the hospitality industry, but also unions like, like USWW, who continued to advocate for workers not only just to be protected on the job, but to come back to those jobs when they, came, when they reopened, when, they, uh, when the economy reopened. So, you know, I think we just have to continue to move, to drive, and uh, again, to drive the better the, the, the empowering workers. And we do that by not only just making a transaction, but also building the power 
with the political power they need so they can continue to get their voices heard. David, uh, tú y tu unión son muy poderosos y nos sentimos tan orgullosos del liderazgo que toman aquí en, en, en California. Uh, and this is no. what it's going to take for us to ask for demand immigrant rights and congratulations on your extraordinary contract. Uh, y si se puede. Thank you so much. Si se puede. Gracias, Ada. So our next uh, speaker and panelist is Humberto Gomez. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit about him because he grew up uh, uh, supporting, uh, actually supporting the boycott of grapes with the United Farm Workers alongside his father, Cesar Chavez, uh, G uh, Gil Padilla and Dolores Huerta. He grew up fighting uh, for the eradication of harmful pesticides because some of his friends were born without arms and legs. So Humberto uh, Gomez Jr has also worked for the Laborers International Union of Northern California, fighting for more than 500,000 uh, members in the construction industry for good paying jobs, benefits, and the opportunity for advancement. So brother, it's great to see you. Uh, and I'm glad uh, to hear your voice here. And so I have a question for you. Um, ¿Cómo podemos crecer el número de personas que están listos y en organizaciones y para correr, uh, para asegurar de que mantengamos el poder político y el voto. So the question is, how can we enlarge the bench of Latino political organizers to, to, to grow and harness the power of the Latino vote? In terms of that aspect, we have to uh, professionally develop uh, uh, our upcoming Latinos. And in terms of also, uh, you know, with that aspect, we have to support them uh, financially. Uh, we have to also support them in terms of educating them about the process. Uh, also for them to be uh, the field managers, also for them to be the, to uh, manage the campaign in terms of campaign managers. Because what we want is campaign managers that can pronounce the towns, the cities, that know the areas, that know the issues, and also to definitely empower also, to me is the most powerful force is the Latinas in our community, for them to run, because uh, they always advocate for their kids uh, education, for them to have bilingual education, for them to have access to broadband. And it's such a, it, it's such a powerful thing that we can do. But at the same time that we need to do, lo que tenemos que hacer, Tenemos que invertir en nuestra comunidad cada día. Comienza hoy esta noche. No comienza dos meses a, antes de la elección. The, the, the investment doesn't start for our vote two, two months before the election. It starts tonight, it starts daily. It continues year by year. And we have to ask those tough questions. So the questions is, what can we do? What happens in your life? What happens when you don't have clean potable water access? What happens when you're working in the meat packing plants, in agriculture, in the packing houses? Everything that we do to us is necessary and essential. And for us, we are grateful because we definitely made the inroads in terms of the no and the recall. So we are not apathetic, no tenemos apatía. Solamente que queremos que nuestro partido invierte en nuestros recursos para hacer para que nuestra comunidad gane. Si creemos en esto, si podemos, si se puede, y siempre tenemos que tener, tener esa duda, claro. Y también le quiero dar las gracias a nuestro campeón del Valle, el doctor Joaquín Arambula, que invirtió in the GOTV efforts, mm. door to door, knocking on doors, and that's what we have to do. We have to go to the fields. We have to go to the packing house. We show up at the dog house, the outhouse, the normal houses. That's what we do, and that's what we will continue to do. Bien dicho, Humberto, muchas gracias. So folks, you've met your panel today. Let's pin them all uh, because we're ready to have a collective discussion. Uh, vamos a escuchar de, todo, de, de, de todos los panelistas uh, que nos van a, um, a, a platicar un poco. Y les quiero acordar a los panelistas que por favor uh, digan su, sus... Um, uh, lo que van a decir en inglés o en español. Tenemos, uh, tenemos la habilidad 
uh, mm -hmm. de hablar en los dos idiomas. So the first question is, Latinx, Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, how do you identify and why? And I am gonna start with Sonia. Um, I identify as a third, fourth generation Chicana from East Los Angeles. Wonderful. Uh, Angelica. Um, I say I'm a Latina, Mexicana, Inmigrante. Um, so that's how I identify. Eso. David. So I would say Chicano, Latino, Mexicano, Americano. Bueno, buenísimo. Humberto. Uh, Latino, Mexico Americano, pero también agradezco the, the low riders and the cruising uh, of our, our of our good Chicanos that we have. Mayor Sarmiento. Well, I, I uh, identify as Latino, but uh, you know, having been raised here in Santana, mm -hmm. I'm an honorary Chicano because my wife is from Jerez, Zacatecas, <laughs> and my kids are Mexicanos as well as Bolivianos. And then can we add here Santanero somewhere? Oh, right? Of course, Santaneros. <laughs> you do it. Uh, uh, that's right. Mm. That's right. Did I grab everyone? I think I grabbed everyone, right? Let's, uh, mm. let's go to our next question here. So um, how do we fight the misinformation and scare tactics that are being used by Republicans to reduce the Latino voting power? And I'm going to start with uh, Mayor Sarmiento. You know, I think that, you know, the hostility, we, we, we've had a good training ground here in Orange County because there's hostility at every turn, right? But I think when they, you know, when we see ourselves having scrutiny stronger than others, because we have, uh, we've had an all Latino council here in Santana for a very long time. This is the first time we have one Vietnamese American, uh, but she's very progressive. And so we're, we're trying to lead by example. So when the scrutiny is there, we're not doing silly things. We're making our community proud. We're putting public policy that is um, critical for them. Like, you know, we're right now going through a rent control debate. We're going through, we, we just did a deportation defense fund. We're the only sanctuary city in the county. Um, so these are things and these are victories that the community has done. So to the extent we can show victories for those people who are doing grassroots work, showing those who are critical of us, because we know that they're completely critical and hostile, showing that we can manage a city. So Santana is, uh, also been has also been touted as one of the most well-managed cities in the state. So I think if we can do both those things, good progressive policy while at the same time being responsible, that's a good look for all of us. That's wonderful. So I'm gonna go to Sonia. Can you do it in Spanish? No, I can. I speak Pocha Spanish. Okay, le, le toca Angelica then in Spanish. But Sonia, <laughs> you go first in English and then we'll get Angelica. Awesome. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that we do at UCLA LPPI is that every issue is a Latino issue. And to that regard, voting rights is a Latino issue. And Latinos suffer barriers to the ballot box and barriers to their fundamental right to participate in democracy in novel ways. Some of our research out of the state of Washington during the 2020 presidential election found that mm -hmm. Latinos who voted by mail were rejected at three times the rate of non-Latinos because of their signature on their ballot. And so this on its face is something where you can vote easy, right? There's a paper trail. It's safe during COVID-19, but guess what? It's discriminatory. Um, and so we have to think about ways that we can support our Congress in reauthorizing and reimagining the Voting Rights Act through HR1 and HR4. There are lots of compromises, but even in states like California and Washington that have their own state provisions, there's more that needs to be done. And I think political parties have a role to play in that by ensuring that trusted messengers are talking to these voters mm -hmm. and investing in the churlas of the world, investing in ground games. Thank you, Sonia. Angelica. Um, bueno, la... Primeramente, lo que tenemos que hacer con nuestra comunidad es combatir la, la desinformación, porque hay muchas campañas que tratan de prevenir que nuestra comunidad uh, participe. Y lo hemos visto desde decirles que el día de la elección es otro día, 
y, y, y realmente promoviendo información que no es correcta. Entonces, por eso es tan importante que nuestra comunidad tenga una organización o un sindicato o el partido que puedan ellos llamar y decir, de verdad, quiero más información sobre esto, um, verdad, sobre esta elección, de qué se trata, cómo puedo participar. Y es muy importante que nosotros estemos disponibles para nuestra comunidad cuando tenga este tipo de de preguntas. Um, y la otra también, ¿verdad? Es de que nosotros um, hemos visto, por ejemplo, que cuando un nuevo ciudadano, um, ¿verdad? Toma su juramento, afuera de las instalaciones nos están registrando. Hemos visto que mucha gente lo registran equivocadamente en un partido que ellos no eligieron. Entonces, cuando nosotros estamos hablando con ellos por teléfono, les preguntamos, señora, señor, ¿usted sabía que usted está registrado como X? Entonces, muchas veces la gente dice, no, yo no, estaba, yo no me registré así. Uh -huh. Entonces, es importante que todo hasta cómo te registras a tu partido. Es tan importante que la gente tenga una conexión y que puedan elegir de una manera intencional lo que ellos quieren hacer con su participación cívica. That's a wonderful point, Angelica, about voter registration and, and making sure uh, that, uh, that we're grounding our, our Latino voters to understand uh, what's happening. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to David, the same question. Disinformation, scare tactics uh, from Republicans, how, how does that reduce the Latino? How, and how do we fight? How do we fight it? Well, yeah, so I think it's a great question. You know, I think. Um, You know, I, I remember back when the, when the vaccines were first introduced, right? And there was so much hesitancy around the vaccine in our community uh, for many reasons. Um, and I don't think it was really Trump-driven as much as it was just misinformation, but also a fear, especially in the immigrant community, of, you know, after the last four years of this administration, of handing over your information to somebody and fear of retaliation consequences for that. And I remember the first time we were able to secure a pop-up in our, in our office uh, to get members, members vaccinated. We were overwhelmed with the response we got from our members because they, were, they trusted who we are and they trusted our voice and they trusted that we were giving them the right information and we were there to protect and to serve them. And so I think we need to make sure that we continue to depend on organizations like Chila, organizations like, like HERE, labor, community organizations, Um, every way we can to be able to get that trusted voice into our community. Um, you know, we even have to look towards the church as well and how we can collaborate with them, considering the, the number of folks who, who consider themselves, you know, uh, you know faith-driven in their, in their beliefs. So there's many different ways, but I think it's always important that we always try to look to the trusted voice. I mean, who is it that our community trusts, and how can we go through that voice in order to be able to talk to our, our community in a way that, that they will trust What, what they're being told as opposed to this information. The misinformation depth, I don't know how much we can really, you know, unless we shut down Facebook, shut down social media out there, um, which that is not going to happen again. And we just need to have to continue to persevere and continue to work with communities so that they trust the voices that they listen to. That they listen to. Thank you, David. Humberto, la misma pregunta. Este... Una parte también lo que tenemos que hacer este, es recordar nuestra gente. ¿Qué ha sido el Partido Demócrata? Como yo les puedo decir que para nuestros campesinos aquí, este, el desempleo no era algo dado. Teníamos que pelear para el desempleo para los campesinos. Antes no había desempleo para nuestros campesinos. Imagínate. ¿Ves? ¿Quién ha tratado de enfocar cuál partido especialmente para este, aumentar este, el movimiento laboral de sindicatos? ¿Cuál partido ha tenido este, al menos una plataforma para nuestra comunidad inmigrante para que se sea ciudadanos? ¿Quién ha peleado para nuestros soñadores? ¿Ves? Cuando tenemos eso, es, es toda esa plataforma, le podemos decir a nuestra gente, que ¿sabes qué? Mira, esto es lo que tratamos de hacer. Esto es lo que tenemos en nuestro corazón. ¿Ves? Y siempre vamos a estar ahí peleando. Y también que, también que hable 
que, que es una persona que se parece como nosotros. Yo soy un poco morenito, pero está bien, ¿ves? Pero al menos tengo, esa, tengo el idioma. Conozco también, este, también tenemos personas que son muy religiosas, conservadoras. Y también que en este momento estoy peleando en la desinformación, especialmente de las vacunas. Claro. Porque, porque nuestra comunidad sufrió bastante. Este, podemos ver en los certificados de fallecimiento este, cuántas vidas tenemos más en nuestros condados. Este, y, y eso es lo que tratamos de hacer. Pero tenemos que darles un, este, explicarles de nuestra historia, el Partido Demócrata. Claro que sí. Gracias. Buen punto, buen punto. All right, so we have a final question for you, and we're going to have Sonia kick us off. And that is, when you think of Latino Heritage Month, with, with respect to the political process, what is one thing that makes you smile and gives you hope? It's kind of the same thing that we saw in November 2020 and then Georgia on January 5th, 2021, and then here in California, September 14th, which is that voters are turning out to safeguard our democracy at a time where they're not really thriving during post-pandemic recovery because we're not post-pandemic. But they, despite all these barriers to casting a ballot, despite mm. the barriers to fair mm. housing, equal opportunity, good jobs, they're making it possible for this fragile democracy to continue the pathway mm -hmm. forward. And for that, that makes me smile because Latinos, along with Black Americans and Indigenous Americans and Asian Americans, have an outsized role in making that happen. Beautiful, um, really, really beautiful. Mayor Sarmiento. Mira, lo voy a dar esta respuesta en español porque me siento tan contento aquí en Santana porque somos una de las ciudades más jóvenes. Tenemos una edad mediana como de 27 años. Entonces, lo que yo tengo mucha esperanza es de que últimamente los jóvenes latinos se han involucrado en el proceso político a un nivel uh, bien, bien grande. ¿o no? Han hecho una diferencia aquí, no nomás en Santana, pero en todo el condado. Son, son jóvenes que están yendo a, sus, a, a, a los cabildos, están yendo a, a, las, a, a las juntas de los supervisores y, de, y pidiendo y demandando que hagan cambios. Entonces, lo que yo veo es un valor, veo ese, esa fuerza que ahora se sienten que pueden cambiar su mundo, su futuro y el camino. Entonces, mm. eso es lo que me inspira a mí, porque yo sé que para mí, ellos, esa demográfica de 18 a 35 años son los que salieron a votar en una cantidad bien alta, pero también bien temprano. Entonces, ellos no nomás están votando, pero están coordinando, están abogando, están organizando. Entonces, eso es donde yo veo que cuando me pongo a pensar el futuro y la esperanza de nuestro partido, especialmente de los latinos, tiene un futuro muy brillante. Buenísimo. Humberto. Oh, pues me perdí un poco allí, pero solamente este, nomás este. What makes you smile or gives you hope as, as oh you're my gosh. Latino Heritage Month and the political process? What always gives me hope is that, you know, there's always going to be, siempre vamos a tener una batalla. Eso es lo que tenemos que entender. Pero nuestra gente aunque no estaba, tenía ese pensamiento cívico para votar, pero votó, votó, aunque tenían que ir al trabajo 15 horas, aunque todavía si fui, ibas a su marqueta, había vegetales y frutas este, frescas, no, está, este, no había papel del baño, pero había nuestro alimento. Y el alimento era porque nuestra comunidad allí estaba. Y eso es lo que me da ese, ese pensamiento que sí se puede. Y también lo que podemos hacer. Yo cuando voto, traigo mis niños. Siempre mi, mi madre y mi papá me jalaba de las greñas. ¿Ves? Y por favor, aquí están las urnas. Esto es importante. Esto claro. porque, ¿sabes por qué? Pero muchas gracias. Es lo que me da este pensamiento uh, uh, siempre. 
porque tenemos esas ganas. Gracias, Humberto. David. Gracias, Ada. So, lo que a mí me hace contento es que, you know, en, en cuatro años de Trump, la gente nunca aflojó, la gente luchó, siguió luchando para algo mejor uh, y salieron, salieron en 2020, fue con números grandísimos y lo vimos también en 2021 con el recall. Son su me da ánimo porque la gente, sabemos que la gente, la lucha en la gente está ahí todavía uh, y estamos you know, en, en mejor disposición a seguir esta lucha, especialmente con el juventud que tenemos, el próximo generación. Y eso me da una, me motiva mucho a ver esta próxima generación que está luchando para el futuro. Buenísimo. Angélica. Bueno, uh, I just want to say um, that the immigrant families I work with give me so much hope because many of them and even the, our, our political director, our field manager, they can't vote. They're DACA. They're um, the families that are knocking on doors. They can't vote but they know that the election has consequences on their lives. So I see them with, it's like a whole family affair. And that's why I'm talking about the immigrant families. It's the, the wife, the husband, or if it's a, you know, the partners um, out there with their children knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's about democracy and civic and participation isn't just about the election because those same families, the day after the election, They were marching in the streets for immigration reform. And then they traveled to Washington, D.C. to demand that action be taken on their issues so that they see civic engagement so much broader. And so I am I am so inspired. I am inspired by them every day. Um, that is what motivates me to keep going because they are tenacious about a future that includes them, a future where everybody is treated with the respect and the human dignity that they deserve. And so they grab onto that, but they do the work today so that that future that they dream of becomes a reality. Y lo voy a decir en español porque le quiero dar gracias a todas nuestras familias inmigrantes. Muchos de ustedes que no, es, no pueden votar, sin embargo, están empujando a su familia, tocando puertas, diciéndoles por favor voten. Y es toda una familia en conjunto trabajando y los jóvenes también participando. Y también en nuestra propia organización, muchas de las personas que están liderando nuestras campañas, nuestra directora política, las personas que están haciendo todo el alcance en, en, la, en, en la calle, muchos de ellos son DACA, no tienen ese, ese, esa oportunidad de votar, sin embargo, ahí están y están peleando por un futuro que los incluya. Friends, la lucha sigue, we know it, and we're in great mm -hmm. hands. Uh, I've had an amazing time hearing your thoughts um, and, uh, and moderating this panel. I'm very thankful for your participation on here. I'm, I'm very thankful uh, to, to all of you for your time uh, and, and sharing your ideas and your thoughts. All I know is that we need to find 25 Sonias and 55 Angelicas, and we've got to figure out how to grow and find as many leaders so we can win more. So folks, it's, it's, it's time to recruit, to find, uh, to find great leaders across California to keep doing the great work. Uh, again, thank you. Um, and now I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our executive uh, director of the California Democratic uh, Party, uh, Yvette Martinez. And I want to tell you a little bit about Yvette. Uh, she is not only our executive director, but she comes to us with 25 years experience in managing campaigns, building diverse coalitions and directing opinion leaders engagement programs. Over the course of her career, she's worked on campaigns at all levels uh, you know, of the ballot from school, local school board races to national presidential campaigns. Yvette, Yvette is especially proud of how many talented Latinos she has helped elect. And she's renowned uh, throughout California as a spokesperson for her community, for our community, with a special expertise on how effectively organize, engage, and mobilize Latino voters. In 2008, Sacramento's Capital Weekly named uh, Yvette Martinez as one of California's one to watch for her campaign work and her expertise in developing Spanish language outreach programs. So it's with a great honor uh, that I now turn it over to Yvette Martinez. 
Thank you so much, Ada. And thank you for working with our party team and our staff on creating this program tonight. It's been such an honor and it always is a pleasure uh, to work with you. You put all of your heart and soul into this work. And I think that's what really matters in this work that we're trying to do to turn out Latino voters. Um, and thank you to the panelists. It's been a long night. It's been a long year of campaigns that never ends. But I wanna share something that I'm really proud about here at the party. We now have a paid internship program so that young people can be mentored and get paid for the hours that they pit, pay, uh, put in volunteering for the party. Very proud of that. We just started that uh, this past year. We also just implemented this past year our forever organizing department with full-time organizers year round who are devoted to getting out the vote and turning out uh, voters and knowing and understanding the communities that they live in and work in. So very proud about our uh, forever organizing campaign uh, work. And as Sonia pointed out, you know, this is the important piece of the work that we do. And that is not just engaging people when it's election time, but engaging people year round all the time. Because they're like, uh, like um, uh, Umberto said, there's always a fight, right? And we have to be prepared for that and for the fights ahead of us. Um, I wanna also just say how proud we were to work with labor and our community allies to fight back the Republican recall. That was a real quick and dirty campaign for us. We had to pull our army together quickly. We produced uh, bilingual materials very quickly. I'm not sure if you ever saw our door hanger, but it was in English and Spanish. We did everything we could to fight back the recall. And I'm really proud of our team for putting in all of the work and effort, the volunteer calls, the door knocks, the things that uh, we couldn't do last year during the pandemic when we were not vaccinated, we were able to do this time because we were vaccinated and we uh, really took care of our people who were going door to door, making sure that they had the protection, the masks, everything that they needed to talk to voters. And we did that, we did that really well. And I think it really showed. Um, so I'll just stop there and we can talk more about, we're going to hear from one of our organizers and we're going to hear from Carlos Alcala from our Chicano Latino Caucus, but I, I have a very special treat tonight. Uh, I want to introduce a special poet who hails from Gardena, California. Her name is Leslie Honoré. She's going to read one of her poems called Independence. But Leslie is a Blacksican poet and activist and author of Fist and Fire, a collection of powerful poems that confront the issues of social justice from the lenses of real people. Uh, both in her poetry and in her life work, she works to empower youth to find their voices through the arts and inspire people to stand in the gaps that social, economic, and racial inequities create. Leslie challenges readers, inviting them to think, feel, and consider how to create spaces where everyone can thrive. Through her work, she channels and uplifts the people who are often silenced, unheard, and feel indivisible. I am honored to present to you tonight Leslie, who will share her poem, Independence, with us. Gracias, Yvette. A revolution begins with words. It begins with hope. It begins with inspiration, with the bravery to say first to yourself, I want better. I deserve better. I demand better. Then to shout it to the world, we deserve the foot on our necks to be removed the control of our land to end, the independence of our nation, our people, our souls, our future to begin. A revolution begins with words, words that say, even if you kill me, behead me, display me like a slain lamb, I've already planted the revolt. The sleeping are awake. The buried were seeds. And if it takes another 10 years 
or 100, the reaping is coming. If I am alive to see it or you hear my call and ringing bells, the revolution has begun because the words have been spoken. So when I write, I remember. I honor, I face truth. I don't cower to power, but I call upon my own, the blood in my veins, the legacy of a priest and his words that freed a people. So I write to free myself, to connect ink with lineage, and to always shout, Viva Mexico! Muchísimas gracias. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. So powerful, it gave me chills. I uh, wanna make sure that you, if you could, if you can include the link to your website, to your social media. I know you have a book of poetry coming out. How wonderful if we could all support your amazing work. Very proud to have you on our panel tonight, Leslie. And I hope you come back to help us in all the work that we need to do to help our communities. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, next, I'd like to introduce a member of our team, of our forever organizing team, Andrea Guzman. Um, I'm sure those of you in Southern California will remember Andrea. She worked her heart out in this last past uh, recall election training and getting out the vote and helping us translate materials into Spanish. So much work. Andrea is the young leader that we have been dreaming of for our community. I am just so proud of her and the work that she's been doing with our organizing team. We learned so much this past couple of months working together on the recall and all of that work we need to keep doing for next year. We have a lot of on our, on our hands. We have midterms, we have special elections coming up. We have redistricting and new lines drawn. <laughs> the work doesn't end for any of us, but we do it because uh, we care, we're proud and we wanna see change in our communities. So without further ado, let's hear from Andrea Guzman. <laughs> I'll try not to cry. <laughs> Voy a tratar de no chillar. Uh, my name is Andrea Guzman, and I am the Southern Organizing Manager for the California Democratic Party. Uh, outreach to Latino voters is incredibly important to me. As an immigrant from Oaxaca, Mexico, who came here at just five years old and now has the incredible privilege to work for the California Democratic Party. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and I want to ask you to show up again because we need you. We need you to talk to voters in 2022, especially if you are bilingual English and Spanish speaker. Whether that's calling voters, knocking on doors, or reaching out to your network, we need you. So please sign up to assist with Latino voter outreach in 2022 and bring two of your friends. Now I'm gonna say it in Spanish, para los que hablan español aquí. Uh, mi nombre es Andrea Guzmán y soy la gerente de organización del sur de California del Partido Demócrata de California. Contacto con votantes latinos es increíblemente importante para mí como inmigrante que vino de Oaxaca, México a los cinco años y ahora tengo el privilegio de trabajar con el Partido Demócrata de California. Les quiero dar las gracias por estar aquí. Pero les quiero uh, pedir que regresen, regresen a hacer el trabajo porque los necesitamos en 2022 para hablar con votantes latinos. Necesitamos a su ayuda para hablar con los votantes, especialmente si hablan inglés y español, ya sea llamando a los votantes, tocando sus puertas o comunicándose con su red de amigos, familia y los conocidos. Nosotros, el partido, el estado de California, lo necesitamos. O sea, regístrese por favor para ayudar con el contacto de votantes latinos en 2022 y traiga dos amigos con ustedes. Um, and now I want to welcome the chair of the Chicano Latino Caucus for the California Democratic Party, Carlos Alcalá. El presidente Carlos Arcada de Caucus del Chicano Latino del Partido Demócrata de California. Muchas gracias.
One moment, everyone. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, can you uh, can you hear us? I can hear you, but I don't see anything to unmute or put on or turn on my video. Uh, uh, go to the uh, video and make sure you uh, open it up. There you go. Thank you, Carlos. We'll just give Carlos another minute uh, to unmute yourself. I don't see how to. You're, you're, we can hear you now, Carlos. You're good to go. We can hear and we can see you. <laughs> you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. I just want to say, wow, what a program. That was terrific. I really learned a lot about, about everything that's going on in California. I want to tell uh, all the Chicano Latino caucus members that we need to support these grassroots people. It's so enjoyable hearing from people that are heads of unions, that are the heads of organizations. I mean, the people we heard from are grassroots. They're the people that really represent the Latino community. Hey, and what they told us is that Latinos turn out and the way to reach and to get them out is to talk about progressive issues that are important to them. That's, that's getting them out. You know, they have to relate to the, uh, to the people that are, that are getting them out and that's us. If we're going door to door, if we're calling, we're gonna make a difference. And those statistics show the tremendous difference that can be made when we actually get out and start reaching out. I want to mention that on, our, on Friday, October 1st, Southwest Voter Registration is going to have an event, and I hope Senator Padilla can go to that. I wanted to also give a shout out to uh, Sarah, Souza, and Zenaida Huerta, young people who just helped pass uh, SB 714 so that the dreamers can sit on our central committees. We, all, we have to support the immigrants. We have to support Latinas. They're the people that are leading our community. Can't speak enough about what we have to do to support immigrant rights, and to support the dreamers and to support Latinas that are running for office. It's gonna make all the difference in the world. And I wanna thank you, Yvette, for this program. It was so well put together. It was an inspiration. I just loved it. And I probably talked too much already. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, no, thank you, Carlos. I know that you've been in this party a long time, you know, and you, uh, People have a lot of respect for you. And so I hope that you continue supporting the work of our staff and all of our volunteers. And uh, you know, we need to strengthen our Chicano Latino Caucus and get people back out to the polls next year in 2022 and just prepare for all the work ahead of us. So Carlos, I really appreciate your time tonight. With that, we'll let everybody go for the night. I just want to remind you to, if you can donate, thank you. We really appreciate it. If you can volunteer, thank you. We need you. We'll close out with a great song from Selena and uh, have a really great, enjoyable rest of the Latino Heritage Month, which I believe ends October 15th. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Ada, and to our wonderful staff that works night and day to produce these events. Uh, we very much appreciate all of your time. Have a good night. Buenas noches a todos. Hasta luego.